Okay, let us uh, start the last section of the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. Uh, last section of Dhamma Nupasana, Mindfulness of Dhamma. This uh, deals with uh, Four Noble Truths. I heard some, one day somebody said, uh, uh, that uh, when the Four Noble Truths were mentioned, somebody said, uh, that is kid stuff. Let us again to get into something serious. So the Four Noble Truth is the kid's stuff. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Maybe yeah, somebody, somebody has told him that is a kid stuff. So that statement is a very interesting statement because uh, that shows either that person is uh, better than the Buddha <laughs> or deeply uh, immersed in ignorance. That person's ignorance must be so deep that uh, Buddha spent uh, eons and eons and eons in samsara and he just said uh, many a birth in, uh, through many a birth in samsaras seeking but not finding the builder of this house, <coughs> sorrowful is to be born again and again. O house builder, thou art seen, thou shalt build no house again. All thy rafters are broken, the rich pole is shattered, the mind has attained the unconditioned. Only after attainment of enlightenment he was able to make that kind of declaration. But somebody who has never <laughs> a uh, million miles close to the, that kind of attainment, says that uh, Four Noble Truth is the kid stuff. Surely when you hear the words, four words, even the four words don't make any sense. Because uh, the mind is in, in right in their mind there is a huge concrete block, concrete wall or steel wall uh, that they can never penetrate it. So it's not, I won't be surprised if somebody said that. We hear this kind of statement even today, I mean some everywhere. But that is the last and the most difficult uh, aspect of the Buddha's teaching and the entire gist of his teaching is that uh, after 45 years teaching he said because I have taught you all these 45 years only four words nothing else these four words as I said the other day when a uh, monk Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha how to behave towards women, he said only four words, you speak only four words to them, nothing beyond that. And he spent 45 years to talking about these four words. <laughs> so in this uh, mindfulness practice that also comes as last, up to this point everything we discussed is related to these Four Noble Truths. Now here we come to a sort of a dovetailing, tying all these loose ends together. In tying the loose ends together, Buddha said, uh, how a bhikkhu dwells contemplating mind objects as mind objects 
in respect to the Four Noble Truths. Now, Four, four Noble Truths are mind objects. <coughs> When you say mind objects, sometimes it may occur to people that it is out there, over there in the world, and mind has just like a tree, house, you know, uh, uh, movie on the screen, <coughs> something, some kind of mind object. Just like any other mind object, this mind object is in the mind itself. And therefore, we should not look for this outside. So we always have to look inside to see this uh, truth. And that is why in the Buddha's teaching this is called mind objects. And he's, he asked the question, how does a monk dwell contemplating mind objects as mind objects in respect to the Four Noble Truths? Then he outlined Four Noble Truths and simply said, uh, uh, Bhikkhu, understand as it really is, this is suffering. <coughs> To understand that this is suffering, one must have uh, some glimpse of suffering within oneself. Otherwise you cannot recognize that this is suffering. The very word this is suffering implies that this is what is present here, now, in our life. Not pointing out to something that is suffering, you know, the word this is, this refers to here, <laughs> not over there. That is very important to remember. This is suffering. Referring to what? This refers to something which is suffering. When we say this is white, then we have an object with white color. Similarly, when he said a big meditator must say this is suffering, what is this? We will he explain this later on. Then he said, this is the cause of suffering, this is the end of suffering, this is the path leading to the end of suffering. So he outlined the entire teaching in these four sentences. Then he went on explaining the birth is suffering. Birth is suffering he is referring to <coughs> the birth that take, is taking place now, this very moment. And the birth that has taken place many years ago. The birth that is taking place now is what is happening now. It is birth, momentary birth, temporary birth, birth that takes place, that is what is called arising, <coughs> appearing, coming into being. Things are always arising, appearing, coming into being. That also is a birth. And when he said, this is suffering, 
that is the birth that is now taking place in us here this very moment this is suffering and then it mean uh, the wider sense or is a rather narrower sense the birth that we all understand as a birth you know in conventional sense is suffering although we glorify birth we celebrate birth we rejoice birth when we are born we, uh, every year uh, we celebrate it we celebrate birth in order to forget the sorrow <laughs> that that we brought with birth from time to time at least occasionally we uh, try to forget it birth is sorrow birth is suffering uh, not only to the mother who gives birth buddha was not referring to that kind of uh, short lived temporary suffering but the suffering is born with the birth <clears throat> he asked the uh, uh, bhikkhus many times what is the cause of suffering cause of suffering he says uh, craving but the but uh, the cause of suffering is really birth cause of diseases birth cause of death is birth so the one major cause of all this is birth then uh, along with birth we all know everything we brought into this life along with birth then decay is suffering whenever you hear the word decay even in the footnote you can see aging and old age old age and aging do we have to wait that long to see aging suffering i mean it is not that long i mean that is not a big uh, big thing you got to wait for 70 80 years until then you don't realize it if a old age is suffering when buddha used the word jara pali word jara he referred it to <coughs> the entire five aggregates form is going through aging feeling goes through aging perception goes through aging mental formations goes through aging consciousness goes through aging every moment all these age when the we we always talk about uh, you know what is called gerontology aging cells uh, because we are so materialistic and therefore we always refer to material changes material aging material growing all but other four uh, aggregates are totally completely forgotten in fact more suffering is in the aging of feeling perception thought and consciousness more than the body our feeling is aging aging means it arises and ages as soon as feeling arises it arises with aging it ages 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 and then disappears so feeling dies before feeling the the feeling dies it goes through aging and that we don't see only here our our practice is mindfulness practice and 
in the mindfulness practice, as uh, I, want, I want to repeat uh, the things just to put ourselves in perspective, I want to repeat what I said uh, in very um, summary form. In mindfulness there is a pure attention, pure awareness, pure mindfulness, and there is Yonso Manasikara, mindful reflection. These two factors must always go together. Attention, mindful attention, pure mindfulness, and uh, mindful reflection. Four stages. Attention and mindful, pure attention, uh, mindful attention. What is uh, mind, attention is generally anybody can pay attention to anything. You even don't have to be a meditator. Even animals can pay attention. But we go, we train ourselves to pay mindful attention. What is mindful attention? Attention without greed, hatred and delusion. Then mindfulness, pure mindfulness is just letting things mirror in our mind reflect in our mind. When we let things reflect in our mind, we just stay there with pure attention. Attention, mindful attention, pure attention with pure mindfulness. Pure attention with pure mindfulness. And then, in addition to these three stages, we need mindful reflection. In this, <coughs> we have all this. In the, for, in the in understanding of suffering, we have to have all this. We simply pay attention. That is, any ordinary person feel that, feel suffering when they when, as soon as suffering arises, attention draws there, attention goes there. And with that, that attention it has its uh, uh, defilements. It is defiled, it has uh, uh, underlying tendency, either greed, aversion or confusion. But when pure attention goes there, none of them, them is there. And with the pure attention, we can pay, we can stay with pure mindfulness, just watching it. And then we begin to reflect mindfully. Only then can we see the change, the what you call decay of feelings. You simply pay at pure attention to your feeling. you definitely will experience growth, decay of feeling. That is, it is slowly decaying and then comes to maturity, mature, and then it passes away. So is our perception. Perception grows, b takes birth, grows, and passes away. So are our mental formations. You just take any thought and watch with mindful reflection or watch mindfully, the thought has an age. When the, when the thought reaches its old age, it is stale. You don't want to entertain it, maintain it, it then you need another thought and another thought, and so forth. Either thought also go through the same process of aging. Consciousness, your awareness, wears out. <coughs> the aware wearing out of awareness, consciousness, is called aging of consciousness. Aging. So, when you watch this very carefully, mindfully, you can see sometimes the feeling arising moment is very pleasant, beautiful. 
and this beautifully erosion feeling goes through ages aging and then it becomes unpleasant that is how unpleasantness arises because of the very nature of the aging of feeling pleasant feelings turn into unpleasant feeling just like this body very strong healthy young vigorous uh, you know courage and so forth because of the process of aging it becomes a burden similarly the beautiful thought because of the process of aging turns into a burden that is why that is what is called pain and unfortunately it doesn't end there when it passes away another pleasant feeling arises that also goes through the same process when it goes away when it turns into unpleasant painful feeling then we will be very glad that it is gone you are very glad unfortunately it doesn't stay that way another pleasant feeling arises if always painful feeling arises and passes away then we don't worry very much because it is always painful but it doesn't happen that way there is a the feeling teases us the pleasant feeling arises and teases us and gives unpleasant feeling and disappears and therefore uh we have suffering perception the same thing <coughs> take about a thought have you ever had a beautiful thought and you think Gee, this is wonderful i must i must register it in the patent office so that nobody will care claim the ownership of this beautiful thought it is original thought my own thought but it has no value after that somebody else either will steal it somebody else will use it and you have no any thrill from this thought and within your own mind the beautiful uh, original thought will disappear when you become more uh, wise more intelligent and deepen your understanding that original thought is just nothing why it goes through the same process of aging <coughs> so is consciousness so sometimes people think uh, the buddha suffering i have heard people say buddha talks about suffering it is just nothing but psychology psychology it is psychological suffering so they put everything into psychology <laughs> buddha suffering is much deeper than psychology it doesn't uh, unfortunately it doesn't end with this life it perpetuates goes goes even into next life and that is why it is so profound then of course other obvious sufferings uh disease needless to say how suffering it is death is suffering death is suffering to the one who dies before death the very thought of death makes the person suffer why the dying person suffers uh because the dying person has to leave so many things behind and that is why dying person suffers 
if dying person does not have anything to leave behind, <coughs> that dying person has only very little to suffer. But so much behind, uh, uh, he, he or she has to leave behind. Therefore, he suffers. Then, the death of somebody brings sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. That is suffering. And to be associated with unpleasant is suffering. When we say, when the Buddha said to be associated with unpleasant, he meant everything and every being that is unpleasant. People, places, situation, even one's own unpleasant mental state. For instance, you don't, we don't like hatred. We don't really like it. But it arises. It arises in our mind. Something happens without our consent. So we experience suffering. Depression arises in us. We don't like depression. People suffer from um, uh, bipolar uh, state, go through a lot of suffering. Because emotion uh, hit the ceiling one moment, next moment it goes underground. I mean, emotion goes up and down, up and down, so hard. They don't like it. Nobody likes it. So Buddha included all these things that happen to us, whether it is physical, people, emotional, psychological, and whatever, material, immaterial, that appear, that happens to us without our consent. Then to be separated from loved ones, the pleasant, pleasant mm, objects, is suffering, definitely. Uh, and not getting what one wants <coughs> is suffering. And also, um, to get what one wants also is suffering. Not only not to get, And he said, in short, <coughs> the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. Five aggregates don't suffer. Even the five aggregates, uh, the uh, So long as we uh, don't cling to the five aggregates, <coughs> five aggregates is no suffering. Only when we cling to the five aggregates, then the five aggregates become the object of suffering. When I say this, uh, it occurred to me that there was um, uh, an arahant called Adhimutta in uh, Theragatha. His name is Adhimutta. Adhimutta was uh, <coughs> one he, once he was uh, uh, dwelling in a forest. A band of thieves caught him and uh, wanted to kill him 
to sacrifice they because they believed if uh, they did human sacrifice they can become very successful robbers they would not be caught by anybody and therefore they wanted to sacrifice a human being and they found a very good human being this arahant his name is adhimut when he caught and uh, when they caught him and uh, bound his legs and hands and tried to kill him he said uh, i read only in english <coughs> there is no mental pain for one who is without longing chieftain he addressed the chief of thieves truly all fears have been overcome by one who has uh, annihilated his fetters we are fettered to the body the five aggregates once we are loose from these fetters free from the fetters that is our uh, source of suffering there is no pain he said chetasikan dukkham kai kan dukkham chetasikan dukkham physical suffering and mental suffering he said i don't have any mental suffering i do not have the thought i have been no do i have the thought i shall be the constant element will cease to exist what lamentation will there be in respect of that <clears throat> then he said there is no fear for one who sees as they really are the pure and simple arising of phenomena and the pure and simple causes continually of the constituent elements chief then what exists is the pure element pure elements there is no fear for one who who sees as they really are the pure and simple arising and arising of uh, phenomena and the pure and simple cause continuity then he said when by wisdom one sees with see with uh, one sees the world as being like grass and wood not finding possessiveness thinking it is not mine he does not grieve group of <coughs> uh, in in deragata there is a section called group of 20 in that you can see this stanzas so so long as we cling to the five aggregates suffering exists physically as well as mentally so that is why the buddha said in short five aggregates of clinging are suffering <coughs> you know the wording is so confusing when you say five aggregates of clinging are suffering that means the aggregates are suffering because when you say five aggregates of clinging are suffering these five aggregates of clinging are suffering it is not the five aggregates of clinging that suffers but clinging to those five aggregates that causes suffering that is suffering uh clinging is suffering because when you when we cling to something we always have a, a restlessness and fear uh of uh, losing what we cling to uh 
if we do not cling <coughs> and uh, uh, if we do not cling we don't fear that somebody will come and you know snatch it away from us before somebody comes and snatch it from us if we go give it then we have we have no fear just imagine the uh, the when you carry a big uh, bundle of uh, money to the bank a thief will come and try to snatch it from you see the fear and struggle you have when you carry the bundle if the thief comes before he approach approaches you you leave the bag of money and run away you are safe he will take the money and go away <coughs> but if you hold on to it he will kick you punch you or even shoot you and snatch the bundle of money but if you give uh, give it before he comes you are safe <laughs> in fear you go free similarly when we are attached to the five aggregates we always have fear that mara will come and attack us mara will come and take us away mara will do this and that but if we live without clinging to the aggregates when the aggregates disintegrate we have nothing to lose no fear no no suffering that is the concept that the buddha was uh, teaching so <coughs> then buddha defined the uh, suffering of uh, uh, what do you call this uh, birth uh, aging and death and so forth one by one uh, perhaps we skip that section to save time then we go to uh, uh, you see the he, he defined the sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair each part is very interestingly defined Uh, what monks is decay <coughs> aging decaying broken teeth gray hair wrinkled skin the dwindling away of one's ears the weakness of the senses faculties of various beings in some group of beings here and there this monkey is called decay i said this when i came to this uh, sit here i said this uh, light is not bright enough this was bright when it was when they were installed some many years ago <laughs> it was not the light that was the my eyes were weak <laughs> i don't want to admit that <laughs> i say the light is weak so that is what is happening <laughs> aging weaken our senses as buddha said here and that is not very calm, very very uh, uh, pleasant very comfortable uh, not that something we like to welcome so uh, and what is death we don't have to explain that everybody knows that uh let us go through this uh, one by one very quickly sorrow 
whatever anyone is afflicted by one thing or another of painful nature, by any kind of misfortune, by way of sorrow, grief, distress, inner grief, inner war, this monk is called grief. I think the rest of it you can read. Uh, yes? Ah, yes, it has a meaning. It means not in one single form of life. Any different, different, different types of life in various realms, human realms, animal realms, divine realms, realms of ghosts, goblins, in order to include all of them, the word tamhi, Tammi he used. Not to preclude any beings. Sometimes uh, people can ask, uh, how about the birth as a divine being? A deity, king of gods. Be taking birth as a Brahma, practicing meditation, attain highest jhanas, and uh, when you die, you will be, according to the Buddhist cosmological explanation, uh, one can be reborn in a, uh, Brahma realms, where the lifespan is eons and eons and eons, light years long. How about them? They enjoy pleasure all the time. All these lives are measured by a certain number of years, even a certain number of eons. When you give a number, limit, that means that particular life ends after that. When that period is exhausted, the life ends. That ending, wherever there is an ending, that is subject to suffering. Because uh, ending is some, especially higher you go, uh, the more painful it is when you fall. The greater the pleasure they enjoy, the severe the mental agony they experience even before they are dead, because they are going to lose all this. Somebody who is uh, uh, down to earth, having nothing, uh, very little, the, the suffering from death is not that uh, uh, painful because the person is almost dead, almost miserable. But someone who is enjoying and therefore, uh, Buddha did not preclude any living being. All uh, beings uh, have suffering. In order to include that, he said, Te sang, te sang, satanam, tham, tham, Te sang, te sang also means uh, beings of those, of those, of those. Tammi, tammi means in those, in that place, in that place, in that place. That means in various forms and shapes of lives. Okay, we go to the next section. Uh, noble truth of the arising of suffering, cause of suffering. A cause of suffering, as we all know, uh, we have already discussed it many times, uh, is uh, desire. And what is the noble truth of suffering? Arising of suffering. So Buddha said, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for non-existence, 
these are the uh, there is craving arising arises and established okay let us uh, uh, spend few minutes before we have a break on these three types of cravings uh, Craving for existence, craving for non-existence, and craving uh, for sensual pleasures. We can understand the suffering arising from craving for sensual pleasures and craving for existence. We can understand. What is the craving for non-existence? <clears throat> Especially people uh, who think that uh, uh, this is the only life we have. After death, everything will come to an end. For them, in their mind, they think it is uh, uh, sort of relief, satisfaction, they think after that everything is over. And they even can look forward to death because they think that is everything ends there. And this is one of the things that Buddha mentioned in not getting what one wants. This is one of the things that he mentioned, not getting what one wants. There he said, uh, those beings, he said in Pali, I, I just avoid to <laughs> use Pali in order to, in order to reduce your suffering. <laughs> in Pali, he said that, uh, those who are uh, of the nature of birth, wish may rebirth never come to me. May I will, may I not take rebirth anymore. Yeah. He said, those who are subject to birth, those who are of the nature of taking rebirth, may wish that may rebirth never occur to me. May I never be reborn again. That's a wish. And Buddha said, by so wishing, they cannot stop it. Mm -hmm. then the wish for non for non rebirth is a wholesome chanda. You know uh, Am I wrong? It, uh, wrong. It, you are wrong. It is not wholesome. Something to be wholesome, it should be free from greed, hatred and delusion. Here is a delusion in the mind. That is a very interesting uh, logical question. You have seen suffering, yes. especially some people suffer all their life. And they are so frustrated, so tired of suffering, and they wish, I will, I, I, I never be born again. I don't want this suffering anymore. By so wishing, that person cannot stop no, that's taking rebirth. And therefore, that wish itself is not wholesome not wholesome because this wish comes out of frustration, not with wisdom. When you attain wisdom, gain wisdom, you don't have to make a wish. But it's there, isn't it, Bhante? What? People are seriously practicing at the back of their mind. There's no desire for rebirth, is there? Right, wants to attain enlightenment. Even before that, I should say, uh, 
you know, uh, you, that is also a good part of the question. Let me finish the first question. Eh? This part, you hold on to this one. And the first question is uh, uh, one who has, uh, one who suffers a lot, wishes not to take free birth, and uh, they are by so wishing that person cannot stop free birth for several reasons. One reason is that wish is just an uh, empty wish. Uh, there is nothing to substantiate that wish. Second, the, the root of rebirth has not been eliminated. Without eliminating the cause of rebirth, no matter how hard you wish not to have rebirth, you will not fulfill it. You cannot fulfill that wish. And therefore, thirdly, that itself is suffering. Because in spite of against your wish, you take rebirth. Against your wish, you take rebirth. So something happens against your wish is suffering. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that right. You know, if somebody is so frustrated, wanted to commit suicide, that very moment, suppose somebody takes a gun and holds here against, that instant, if you can intervene and give him hope, give him hope, and give him the best that he ever wished in his life, would he commit suicide? No. He will throw away the gun and live very happily. I have um, some experiences like that. Uh, some suicidal uh, cases not of course holding gun, but they are contemplating committing suicide. I have saved their lives. Because at that moment when they are contemplating, if you can give them hopes, they live. So out of frustration you may think the life should, this life is enough, we don't want any more life. Uh, by wishing so, you cannot stop. Next slide. To answer the second question, somebody is practicing, say, meditation, hoping never to have rebirth again. That's a wonderful wish. But unfortunately, in this life, the person may not be 100% successful in his meditation may not attain full enlightenment for one reason or another. That uh, wish, of course, is unfulfilled. The person will be very disappointed when the person dies. The person might, might think, gee, I wanted to end it. I could not finish end it. I have to take another birth. I don't know how many more births, but at least I will be reborn. So even that is frustrating. And therefore, uh, Buddha's statement is that wishing not to be reborn again without eliminating the cause of rebirth is suffering. I think we have a short break now and come back and we continue afterwards. <coughs> this section also is very interesting, yes. <coughs> 